the shock of my life happened from a sheer powerful experience of being it was power when this wind and this creature ran me over now i'm looking at this most beautiful woman that is glowing this beautiful uh, bluish white light and it was a circle on the ground lit up around her she was hovering three feet off the ground about my chin because i was on my knees with my butt set on the back of my legs right and the first thing she did she looked at me and she said you know why I'm here. And I knew exactly because my brain was, was all it could think of is you got to tell this. And I heard them. I knew that was my job to tell the world. She said, this is your burden. You must bear is exactly what she said. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Your Superior Self. Today, I have the amazing Chris Bledsoe joining the show. Chris, thank you for taking the time, my man. Trey, I appreciate you having me. It's my pleasure. I read your book, UFO of God. Never thought I'd read a book with the title UFO of God in it, right? Like, um, not a big UFO guy, but I read that title and I immediately had to pick it up. And I'm glad I did because your story is just so attracting to me, right? Like the Southern guy that explores um, phenomena, right? Or a phenomena comes to him. And I mean, there's a lot of suffering too in this book. There's no shortage of suffering in this book. Um, before we get started, right? Let's give some people some context, right? Um, on your Instagram account, you have video footage of orbs that come to you basically every night, right? And you film it and you put it out on, on your Instagram handle. Um, what is an orb, first off? Well, um, I really don't know. I have my ideas, right? And uh, the first thing I, I want to say is I don't want to influence anybody's beliefs or thoughts on this. I think if you read my book, I think you can grasp a good idea of it being pretty benevolent and whatever it is. Uh, I honestly, uh, because in 2007, I was so sick and ready to give up on life after losing uh, 2007, after losing everything and having Crohn's disease for so many years. And it just all accumulated. I had a doctor poison me by accident he overdosed on drugs and died nobody knew that this guy was taking drugs and he was treating patients he put 113 in the hospital or more i was 113 so um i was i was at the end of my rope and i was crying out to the heavens who's ever up there i don't know but please help me. And I never realized that uh, these big balls of fire would come. There were three giant, let's say 40 or 50 feet around, uh, big as a house, you know, a two story house, glowing about 300 yards away. And one came and took me for four hours. And they came because I was reaching out, praying and suffering. You know, crying out to God, help me. I don't like what I'm thinking. I was thinking suicide and everything else. And with four children and my wife, I love more than anything. I, I just couldn't go there. So I was begging for help. And and today um, and, and ever since, I just do the same thing. I go out and I say a prayer. And uh, here they come. And it's gotten so much greater. I've been able to share it. I, there's a new History Channel series called Beyond Skinwalker. It airs. Uh, it's already playing. I'm the eighth episode, which is the grand finale. And I think everybody's going to be surprised when they see that because mm -hmm. um, we have changed the ball court. I think mm -hmm. with this, there was a there was a lot of success and. 
than what they got there. So awesome. Well, what's the difference between the orbs that you shoot on your Instagram account and the orbs that you were introduced to in January 8th, 2007? I really don't think there's any difference. Um, they can change shape and size at, at will. They can look like a metallic spear to a glowing ball of light. They can shrink to the size of a firefly and be as big as 40 or 50 feet around that I've seen, and they may be even much bigger. Um, but I, I really don't know. I've seven, almost 17 years, come January, will be 17 years, I've been documenting this. And there's no shortage of government officials uh, that are, uh, are studying it with me, along with academics and uh, many others. And sometimes we have as many as 20, 30, 35 people here. Usually about 20 or 25 is, is an average group, but uh, it, many hundreds and hundreds have been here mm -hmm. or I've been to their place. It doesn't matter where I go. It, it comes. Uh, sometimes I think one night on the History Channel, we filmed 35 orbs in one afternoon, 35. Wow. And they had the latest technology, artificial intelligence. They call it a UFO dad or a dad which is um it looks like a surveyor's uh gps thing on top of a tripod and had two of them to be sure and it scans the whole sky and it's uh, connected to norad and nasa and the whole government system the faa and it, it rules out any known object from a nut and bolt flying in space to to you know drones or satellites and uh, we got them we got them ground level we got them in the forest we got them in the air right on top of the trees and so I, I don't know i'm still trying to figure out who they are but i have my thoughts about it can you talk a little bit about the story right like the introduction to these orbs um because you talk about the beings that are associated with that right and i, I was just thinking about it this morning as i'm going out for a run in the morning it's like the sun is starting to come up it's kind of um, you know, it's, it's dark, but it's not too dark and there's deer everywhere. Right. Like, and I'm running down this road and this deer pops out this big buck and it like scares the crap out of me just for a minute. Right. I can only imagine like you, your story was takes place out in the woods, right. That, that night that you hit rock bottom and you're taking a walk. I can only imagine the fear that you felt when you saw these beings, right? Like they're not deer, they're beings or they're, they're beings that you describe so well in the book. Can you talk about that experience? Yeah, um, when uh, speaking of not the orbs, but the beings himself, um, that was the same night, January 8th of 07. Um, I honestly, you know, was sh the shock of my life crying out for help. And this comes these beings with red eyes and glowing little creatures. They're about. Well, they look humanoid. They look like little children, four foot tall, three and a half, maybe, uh, with a triangle on his chest and these red glowing eyes. Um, I thought I was dead. I thought they were going to hurt me. I just, uh, it was a total surprise that um, I turned around. I, I was, it's in the book, more detail about me being in my, well, after the river incident. My son and I came home, and that's when they followed us home. My dogs were all upset in the backyard, barking at something. So I went out there, and my Chesapeake Bay Retriever, 110-pound female dog, took off in the woods after whatever was in there. So I ran around this head of woods, uh, living out in the country, you know, with my next to my mom and dad. I, I went around this head of woods to cut off whatever was in there. I was thinking an animal, a bear or something, the way they were acting. My dad had 15 hound dogs that he hunts with. So I was no, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't new to me growing up with a gun in the woods, hunting deer and bear and everything else. So it was just one of those things uh, that I thought we were going to see something come through this head of woods. And I ran around and um, here comes the dog. I cut her off. I got there and she was still coming. Small head of woods. 
very thick. And um, I turned around to look behind me to see if my son was there because he was following me out there. But he had had enough and went inside and locked the door. And uh, when I turned around, there were three feet from me, three and a half, four feet. I could have reached over and touched it. It was just a little being. And my heart sank. I knew I was in trouble. I just thought, oh, my God, this thing's going to kill me. Uh, so I, I just kind of squared myself towards it. Uh, you know, I, I was le leaning against a tree. You get more details in the book. But when I turned to face it, I lowered my arms and I said, I surrender. And it said um, in this loud voice, you don't understand. We're not here to hurt you. We're here to help you. And that's when... Um, the dog came on through and ran it away. It just disappeared. And next day, I didn't feel symptoms that I'd felt for almost 18 years of, uh, you know, sickness in the bathroom 20 times a day. That was my life with Crohn's. And after that point, I never took another pill. I can eat anything I want, drink anything I want. And for Imagine drinking water for 18 years. You couldn't drink soda. You couldn't eat fried food. Everything baked, and then you were sick. I mean, it was an awful thing to live with. Uh, get up to go to work. I'm back at the house five minutes later in the bathroom. And so um, tell me what it is. You know, I'm still trying to figure. All I can do is tell the story and let people figure it on their own, get glean what it is that's happening but uh, if you ask me I, you know i'm thinking biblical angels from the bible that's kind of my thought because they come in prayer and uh, but who knows we'll see we're still studying it. what well you see the orbs pretty frequently right like how often do you see the beings beings are the orbs they come out of the orbs. I have video of an orb approaching me with two ladies, one on each side, and the one on my left hand side is very sick with stage four cancer, lung cancer. She's in the book. And um, we're standing out near this famous tree that caught fire on my property. And uh, all that's in the book. Uh, a lot of call them, a lot of people call it the burning bush, right? So she's standing next to me, and there's a whole group of us there, and they were all seeing orbs appearing around us, you know, last this big. They get big as a beach ball, and then they shrink to nothing, just appear quickly. And um, suddenly an orb appears, and we're filming. This orb comes within, say, five feet or four feet of us, straight on at me, and then it flashes. And when it flashes... Now there's a six or seven foot tall, white glowing figure, and the orb is inside of this figure. So the, the being come out of the orb, now the orb's inside the being. You know, I've witnessed that more than one time, but I have it on video, which is pretty amazing. That is amazing. Um, but the girl, the lady, Sharon, uh, was cancer free after that. I mean, it, 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 she was in bad shape. And now she's cancer break. So. Wow. Do you, does she, is she able to see beings like that now? She sees the orbs with me all the time and at her home. She sees the orbs. I don't know about the beings. I, that's very rare. But if you see the orbs, you can count on them. They're intelligent beings. But what's their message, right? When they come, like they, they help heal, right? They've helped heal, heal you of, um, your physical ailments like has there has there been a, a uniform message that they're helping people to understand and you know, they're very vague on what they say but what they do um they do tell me is that there is a shift in the powers of both we're going into a new age the age of the divine feminine and that peace is going to come and they're going to wake up the people they're going to make themselves known, whether we like it or not. And um, they asked me if I would just tell what I know. Well, I don't know anything, really. You know, all I can tell you is here is how it comes. Here it is. 
you want to come see it, um, I wish I had enough days to allow everybody to come, but, you know, right now it's scientists mostly and academics and um, many others come, and we're studying all we can to figure out what it is, but there again, it, to me, it answers prayer. Mm. And like I've always prayed, and I'm not a religious person. I was. I grew up in a Baptist church, and I married a Pentecostal holiness girl, which we've been married 40 years and raised four beautiful children against a lot of odds. I mean, ostracized by the church, uh, everything you can imagine. And uh, but we've managed to, to stay together and happy. But I lost that religious thing. I become more spiritual and knowing. Uh, this new you know, it's not faith for me anymore there's something there something created us and i think they may be it i don't know it's all a new frontier sure and we're like, like babies climbing mount everest with just a diaper on right no <laughs> <laughs> how far we got to go well, what kept you going right like to your point you were ostracized by society the church some of your family um, no one else was seeing these phenomena, but you, maybe some of your other family members, but what kept you going? Well, the fact that I walk outside and here they come and they, uh, you know, once you experience something like this, there is no going back. You can run and hide from it and it'll leave you alone most likely. But um, it took me and it washed me very good, like scrubbed me in a way that that uh, it affected me so greatly that I could never stop. I'll be documented to the day I die. I can promise you. In fact, I have plans to go to the desert southwest, to Utah, Arizona, and that area, and uh, maybe Nevada. I have a suspicion Utah is a big, big deal for some reason. It's in my book. I talk about it, my experience with this beautiful lady. So I think she's going to allow me to film her, or at least something much greater that everybody's going to say, oh, my God, That's when it happens. awesome. Yeah, you, to your point about the lady in the book, I mean, you're at your breaking point, basically yelling to the sky, to the heavens, that you're, you've had enough, right? Like no one else is experiencing this phenomena. You're being ostracized. Your, your children are feeling the effects of that d directly and the relationships at school and the community and you just are fed up and you start yelling to the sky that I'm done with you. I'm done with this mission, whatever this is. And then that evening you have an experience. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, five years had gone past since it all uh, happened. And I was so eager to tell the world, you know, I'm not sick anymore. I had this experience. There were four other people, my son and three grown men with me. They all saw it. They all hunted for me. And um, it, 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 it just, it, it changed me um, in such a great way. I'm, I'm sorry I got sidetracked there. No, you're good. Well, the, the lady, right? The, the, the first night the you met the lady. Yeah, okay. So it was, um, it was April, I think, uh, well, it was Easter. Saturday night before Easter in 2012. After five years of my kids being put to the test uh, at school, they go to school because they did a documentary, Discovery did, MUFON, this organization, they did a hack job on us. And um, it, it caused the worst trauma for my family, what they did to us. You know, I'm being honest telling this, and they're trying to cover it up, and they tried. They've screwed up. They never realized it would be it was coming back. And um, but five years of this misery of my children being heckled and laughed at in school, and they were young. My daughter was 10 years old in elementary, and my, my oldest was 17. He quit school. My middle boy was uh, 15 years old trying to date for the first time and it just 
caused them all to be withdrawn and embarrassed. And so they had put it in my head to tell what I know. From the very beginning, I had to tell it. I, it was overwhelming. You got to tell what you know. And so five years into it, I decided I wasn't going to say another word. I'm done. I have, um, last time I've seen my children cry, I had to make something change and right. So I walked out that Easter Saturday night and I shouted to the heavens, why did you do this? For five years, I've been trying to take a, just a photo to share with my parents in the neighborhood. You know, this I'm not crazy. They they labeled me crazy. They wanted to put me in an insane asylum. I mean, all kind of crazy things you wouldn't imagine. The church got between me and my children, telling them I was possessed and all kind of crap. And um, that's what drove me away from this religious thing. So I walked out that night and said, look, you've asked me to do this, to tell it. And I've been telling it. You won't let me get a photo. My wife and children are seeing it. I can't share it with anybody else. I'm done. I'm not doing this ever again. And I meant it. So I went in, went to bed about 930. And at three in the morning, I hear this loud voice that said, arise. And it sounded so loud. It shook me out of the bed from a dead sleep. I sat up and I looked straight at the clock. It said 3 a.m. Suddenly, I see this movement. And I felt compelled to to get up and get dressed. I don't know why. I, it was like I had no control. Next thing, I'm out in the back of my property and was out by this very same area that the little bean was, right? There's a dog kennel out there. And that's where that happened. And next thing I know, this great wind, this mighty, strong wind, it wasn't like all the trees were blowing and the leaves were flying. It was concentrated in a small area and it hit me and blew me over backwards. And as I was falling over backwards, I see this cow, big bull coming at me out of the darkness, ran right over me and I could see right up through it when it went over me. I, it freaked me out. I hit on my back. So I rolled my stomach. Now I'm facing the other way. I, I mean, as soon as I hit the ground, I was getting up to run. I didn't get to my knees good when the shock of my life happened from a sheer powerful experience of being. It was power when this wind and this creature ran me over. Now I'm looking at this most beautiful woman that is glowing. This beautiful uh, bluish white light and it was a circle on the ground lit up around her she was hovering three feet off the ground about my chin because i was on my knees with my butt set on the back of my legs right and the first thing she did she looked at me and she said you know why i'm here and i knew exactly because my brain was was all it could think of is you got to tell this. And I heard them. I knew that was my job to tell the world. She said, this is your burden. You must bear is exactly what she said. And she said, if you will continue to do what you've been told to do, we'll help you. We'll help you with witness. We'll help you with your camera and so on. And so that renewed me into uh, this new strength, but I was afraid to tell anybody because they already wanted to lock me up, right? They already thought I was crazy. So if I come out telling this, no telling, they may send uh, no telling after me. This is what I was thinking. So I had a big decision to make. And, and it didn't take me much thinking to realize I had to do this. So I, I told it two weeks after it happened. And that immediately brought in people from the Vatican to research from the CIA, from all parts of the government and many other places. And uh, they're all interested in this lady and who she is. She's been seen throughout history. I uh, gave too many details I had no clue about that clued them in on uh, like f the Fatima thing, right? 
same thing. When they saw the Fatima, everybody saw what they thought was a setting sun come down out of the sky. When I was on the river that night, when they took me, I described three setting suns. That's what they look like. Huge. They come out of the sky and they were burning balls of fire. So there was a lot more. The cow. I mean, what a weird thing. But she um, she renewed my strength. And from that day on, I began to document with photo and video and witness. And let's just say this. In the last 24 months, I, um, I can't show you because I'm using my cell phone. But I have a psionics camera. It was two of them given to me uh, two years ago and more. Um, there's probably 2,500 videos that I've taken in the last 24 months. So, and that, there's probably 15,000 on my phone between photos and videos that I've accumulated in the last 16 and a half years. So, um, well, actually, since 2012, not 16 and a half, but mm -hmm. since 2012 is when I was able to start recording this stuff and and now I'm sharing it with others, sharing it with government officials. I was able to share it with the History Channel. And you're talking a major deal because the phenomenon does not allow you to film it. It is smarter than we ever can imagine. It knows every thought. It knows what you're going to do before you do it, where you're going to look, what direction you're going to look before you look. It's that powerful. And so for it to allow me to bring the History Channel here or some film company and film hundreds of orbs uh, is nothing short of disclosure is on its way, I can tell you. Hmm. And we're just beginning. What does the, the lady look like? She was hard to say what she looks like, but she was beautiful. She was um, not very big, not very tall, probably four to four and a half feet. Hmm. I feel most she looked because she was elevated off the ground, she looked taller than she really was, but I'd say probably four feet or a little more. She had this translucent um, golden hair. It wasn't really translucent. It was just this strange goldish, not blonde, but golden colored hair, blue eyes. She was wearing a white dress that looked almost Roman. It was had rolls in it that went to the top of her feet and out to here and with a collar it was like no flesh showing except her feet and her hands and her face and um just pure beautiful mm -hmm. her dress was sparkling like moving and flowing and this loving and energy this this fear for humanity they're afraid she right. she comes to you every easter right Pretty much in either in vision or in person or in her spirit. I've filmed some amazing things. Uh, Have you gotten video of her? Uh, not really of her other than her, this fire that only shows up like it does at Easter time this year. Now, last year at Easter, not this one, but the one before, uh, I was uh, thinking about writing this book. So I went outside and I, uh, Friday night, good Friday, I went outside and I said a prayer. I said, am I supposed to write this book? Should I commit to doing this? And immediately this orb appears over my pond. And we live on 15 acres, it's gated with a little cabin on a pond. You, you got to come through a gate to get in here. And this orb appears up over the pond. So I'm filming it. And it's just a monocular, a little small camera, about like a remote on a TV, this thing. So as I'm looking at the orb, I'm kind of narrating what I'm seeing. And up above, way up there, I see something coming. And it's glowing this reddish, beautiful reddish orange color. And it gets lower and lower. So I take the camera off the orb. I move it over to this. And I'm like, oh, my God, what is that? You can hear me say that on the video. It's changing this beautiful red and orange, tangerine orange colors are flowing through it. And suddenly I see these big wings stretch out. 
Now, this thing's big as an airplane, not a 747, but something uh, like, a, you know, a pretty small jet, but an airplane, a pretty good size one, if you look at it. These big wings came out, and it's flying, and it's diving down. And when it gets to the altitude, it kind of levels out, and then it turns to glowing white, bright white. And then it turns south, and this is a 90-degree turn right over my head, and it turns south and flew out of sight. And I'm filming it the whole time. Wow. Uh, this was Easter of 2022. Has she ever given you a message? Like, you know, what's to come? Like, is there a new earth coming? Is there a new consciousness coming? Like, has she ever given you messages for yeah. you know humanity? She told me, and I wrote this in the book, uh, there are many more, but I'm not disclosing some of this stuff because I just I don't think it's time. Timing, uh, but, right? divine timing. Yeah. But what she did tell me was, and um, she said, and, and I had no clue what it meant. And still to this day, uh, it's just it was a, an alignment. She said, when the red star of Regulus. Now, I don't know what Regulus is. I don't know what all this is, but she said, when the red star of Regulus appears on the horizon before daylight, in the gaze of the Sphinx, at that time will be a new knowledge to come to this planet, to all humanity. So what does that mean? I mean, is it the end of the world? Is it the beginning of a new world? Is What does it mean? And so I called um, a literary agent friend of mine, Lisa Hagen from Virginia. And I said, look, this is what I was told. And she said, let me do some checking. So she, being a, a literary agent, had a clientele of astrologers, right? And so they, she sent it all up to them, and they run it through these star charts. And come to find out there is a real alignment, exactly like she told me, happening in Easter, Easter, of 2026 <laughs> and you know the whole government and every all these people are predicting a huge change in 2026 i brought this out she gave it the message to me in 2012 2013 she came back the next year and that's when she told me that and sure. so for 10 years i've been talking about 2026 Hearing that, right? Some people would automatically, that would bring up fear for a lot of people. But I want people yeah. to understand your experience with this phenomena has never been hurtful. It's never been, it's never, have you, ha I mean, fear, right? When they pop out of nowhere, right? Like, but that's just like a, a physical reaction. But have you ever been, like, has your life ever been endangered with these, uh, with, uh, with this phenomena? Uh, completely opposite of that. Remember, I was sick, um, ready to quit. And, they came, these orbs came, and, and uh, these big balls of fire with prayer and took this stress away only to give me a newfound stress. And it wasn't them. It was the people that did this. It was the church community. It was the neighbors. It was, And I was a pretty popular guy in our town, building 100, 130 homes a year, so everybody knew me. And now they all wanted to bring the pitchforks. And, but, um, I, after that day, Trey, they took my fear away. And so now I walk out and you'll see it on the History Channel. Uh, I ask them to come from the air, they come. I ask them to come from the forest, they come. In fact, the one on the History Channel came out of the air, flashing huge, and dropped down over the Cape Fear River and came right up by us in the woods, 50 feet away. And they filmed it with two cameras. And so all that will be shown on the History Channel. But keep in mind, prayer is what God brought it. They didn't know what I was saying on the History Channel. I didn't say it out loud. They were monitoring my brain. They could tell I was requesting something. Mm -hmm. I was actually saying a prayer. Wow. Giving thanks. So I'm not afraid at all. How has how has your conceptual conceptualization of reality changed? A hundred percent, complete about face uh, reality shock 
because you know we're all taught you know, faith that, um, and, and we're taught by society and science that there's no such thing that we came from monkeys that the earth is a big bang and it has no meaning it's just endless um, space out there and the earth is just catapulted out in space and and uh, it was all created by evolution. So all of that immediately about face changed to me, knowing that it's all different than what I was told and taught all my life. And I think all of humanity is going to realize this really quick. Is this coming? Whether anybody wants it or not, it's going mm -hmm. to reveal it and it's doing it. So fascinating. <clears throat> Now, going back to the four hours that you were missing from that night, right? Like you went through regression. Um, I'm assuming hypnotherapy session or something like similar to regression therapy. And you were able to recall some of those aspects from that night. And you remembered going up, I guess the orb took you, right? And flying over Egypt. What was the significance of that? I don't know, but it's mighty funny that uh, six years later, the lady gives me a complete memory of or a recount of seeing Egypt from above. Then she says, here's a clue. And the red star of Regulus is in the gaze of the Sphinx. So, and also they, they showed me like Hathor's temple. They showed me the significance of the deities in Egypt being animals. You know, they, TV wants to make it alien gods. You know, there are ancient aliens. They came from some, there's no evidence of that. In fact, quite the contrary. Everything you see in Egypt are uh, crocodiles and jackals and horse was a hawk, right? So in Ezekiel, when he had these, uh, the wheel within the wheel, there were two of them came down and landed and he went between them and out steps this creature. Had four faces, had a man, a uh, eagle, an ox, and a lion. So one being had four parts of, of nature, three parts of nature plus humans. So what does this mean? What are they showing us? What is that uh, supposed to mean? I think all life is sacred and that this, this spirit world will communicate with us through animals like owls, like hawks and deer, that deer that crossed your path has a real significant meaning. So go on line and look up, you know, when a, a deer or buck crosses your path, see what it tells you. See, does it have a meaning? Because there, there is a lot of, lot of that um, that I look at daily when this stuff happens. So sure. it, it really is connected. You had two near death experiences in the book too, right? And you and I've heard you previously talk about that, how you were taken or you were out of your body and you felt like you were in a space similar to that night when they took you in that orb. Can you hit on that a little bit? Yeah, exactly the same. Um when I was 10 years old, I was I remember I grew up on in the woods on a in a little mobile home next to my grandparents that owned a farm. Uh, he did, uh, we grew tobacco. We, I mean, I worked farming. My neighbor had a dairy farm. So um, for, for ever, um, I'm getting sidetracked here again. You good, buddy? You good? Just talking about the near-death experience and the death. orb. Um, because of chemotherapy, I've been on, chemo and uh, off of it now but for six and a half years and it messed with my short-term memory when i'm thinking um so it's all good forget. brother it's all it's all good i'm just glad so, you're here man i'm just glad you're here <laughs> when i was 10 years old i was hunting um myself my cousin and my neighbor the dairy farm it was new year's day 1971 um the hunting season was over, so we had a hunting club. My dad was the president. He owned the dogs. It was a big crowd that all showed up for New Year's Day to work on the farm. We, we had 
over a thousand acres we managed. But all year long, they drove down the, the roads and tore up the roads. And in the winter, it's muddy, right? So they were fixing the road. And us three boys decided we were going to go dove hunting. We weren't going to work. We were going to have fun. So we left the camp. They were all out in the farm somewhere, you know, miles away, some of them. And um, this, we lined up on cornfield about a mile from the cabin, middle of nowhere. And I was in the middle. There was my neighbor on my right. We were 100 yards apart. My, my cousin was to my left. So I'm right, we're about 200 yards between us all. Bird comes down the field of dove. My neighbor shoots at it, doesn't hit it. It comes right over me. And when I shot, I winged it and it went, turned and went across the field and landed in the forest. I thought, um, oh, you know, I'm going to go find it. So I took off. I stood up and I walked across about 100 yards of cornfield. When I got to the edge of the forest, my, I had no clue. But my neighbor, young boy, nine years old, he wanted to make claim over that bird. He didn't want me to outdo him, right? So I didn't know he was coming. But I got right up to the edge of the forest. And I could see the bird underneath some briars. And it was flopping around on the ground. I thought, Maybe I better put a shell in my gun. I had an old double barrel, 16 gauge Stevens. And um, I cracked the barrel open. And, you know, back then, the, those old Stevens, the shells would pop out. And, or at least fly, if they were empty, they would pop out. And they did. So I reached in my pocket and I grabbed two more shells. And I went to put them in the gun and I dropped one. When I dropped it, I reached over to pick it up. And I didn't know that my neighbor had run up behind me within six or eight feet of me. And thought he was going to try to get this bird before I did. Right? It was He was claiming. And so when I've been over to pick the shell up, right when I stood up, he was going to fire over my back when I leaned over. I mean, whatever possessed him to do that, I have no idea. I guess it was meant to be. Um, I heard the gunshot. I felt it. It was like you hit me in the back with a sledgehammer. There was no pain. Drove me down face first in the leaves, and I'm bleeding, bleeding bad. I got a hole this big in my shoulder right here, right in line with my heart. Um, I remember asking him, did you shoot me? Why did you shoot me? There was no answer. It was all crying and it was all panic on their part. My cousin, he come running up when he heard it. So they were arguing over who was going to go get help. They had a mile to walk, right? And here I am dying and I, they were fighting. They were actually fighting. I'm, he's my cousin. I'm staying with him. He's my neighbor. They're fighting like this and I'm saying, please help me. And next thing I know, uh, the my neighbor's dad, farmer, dairy farmer, he heard them from that far away, almost a, a mile from the camp. And there was no traffic and all where you had noise, so sound carried a long ways back in the days and out where we were. And next thing I know, he comes down the field in his old farm truck, bottles and cans rattling in it, you know, that dirty old farm truck. He runs in the forest and throws me over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes and blood dripping. And he throws me in the front seat of that old truck and drove me to the hospital some uh, 20 or 30 minutes away, 20 minutes probably. And next thing I know, I'm, they put me in surgery and the way they did it, you know, 50 years ago, they didn't have MRI machines. They didn't have all that so they would do an x-ray to find the amount of lead it was 350 fellas entered my back and they would go and remove what they could see they'd take me back in x-ray and find more and they'd take me back in surgery and they were removing these fellas so the last time they thought they had it all um, they took me back into x-ray and that's when i came to and I saw my mother on the ground. And I mean, she fell to the ground. She was looking at me through these windows. 
but what I remember is being in some kind of clear bubble, like uh, an aura, up above Earth, looking back down at everything. And there was no pain. There was no, um, it was totally silent. I was standing on something solid. Remind me of the Silver Surfer movie where the guy's surfing the space on the surfboard. That's what I felt like. I could touch the walls, but I couldn't see them. It was warm, and uh, it was it was a beautiful thing. But when I came to, reality set in, and that's where uh, the next quite a few months of a struggle with tubes hanging out of my body and going to the doctor every single week. I had to go, and they had to do all kinds of debris because it blew all the skin away completely so they had to stretch all my skin and pull it together and there's still a, a scar this big right and i have lead you can see right here all in my shoulder there's still 17 pieces in there that um they didn't remove and i set the airport off every time i go through <laughs> the airport pat me down every time like I said earlier, there is no shortage of suffering in your story. Do you think that trauma is at all correlated with this phenomenon? It is. It is, I think. And let me tell you why. Um, I have been documenting, if not video, but just people for the last 16 and a half years. So many reach out to tell me their story. Um, thousands and in fact thousands in the last month and um, it's always the same pretty much always the same uh, when so many elderly people elderly men and women especially women will come to me and say um, that their husband died and suddenly they see a light out the window it was like right out of their kitchen window or things start moving around in the house and they all reach out to him even young people alike want to know what's happening. And I always ask them, tell me what life was like when it started happening. And then hang on because here it comes. Every one of them will say, my mom died, my dad died. I lost my job and my wife at the same time. I'm homeless. I was homeless or uh, I lost my child. I lost my sister. And it always comes back the same. That this stuff starts when severe trauma happens. Always. There is no maybe 1% or not even that much over the years have had some different idea or different happening. Why do you think that is, right? Like, is it because it's connecting to, it's connected to us that it's just trying to help us along? I know it's connected without a flipping doubt, and I can prove that that it hears you and uh, we're proving that on the history channel they hear me and it's evident you can hear andy uh from one of the hosts on there saying i don't know how he can tell us within a minute every day when it's going to show up within a minute and um uh, they witnessed it and everybody does i would tell them They'd call me or they'd come over at five o'clock in the afternoon. History Channel, we're here seven days. And I'd say, okay, we need to be out with the cameras at six o'clock. Still daylight, right? Six o. And I'd say, we're going to look toward Jupiter. And right beside Jupiter, at 601, here comes an orb appearing right side. The next day, 630. Be here, be ready. So it gets dark early in the um, in February. Like January, I think we're here in January. So, yeah, it's communicating. It hears us. It knows we're. Uh, it knows our thoughts. Just, it's incredible. What it? What is it? How does it know your thoughts? How does it know where you're going to look before you look? How did I know it was going to appear beside Jupiter at six? I don't even know that other than they put it in my head. You know, they, they just overwhelmingly comes out of my mouth. It's not like, 
plan. Does, is, does it come in like picture form? Like you see a picture. clock with 601 on it and then you go out there and go or, or like it, Great, you talk about feeling, feeling, this word. a feeling with a knowing it, it, it's all, it, it's a multifaceted thing. It becomes a knowing and it becomes a feeling. I associate the two together. I can be in the house and I've demonstrated this. Dr. John Alexander, he, he was here during that event in the History Channel film. So he'll be a part of that. He wrote a book called Reality Denied uh, after 20, uh, 2015. He came to my house in North Carolina. And he's a U.S. Army colonel. He, run, uh, he, he worked at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. Ph. Uh, he's a Ph.D. He's got a degree from Harvard. Um, he runs the non-lethal weapons division of, of the government and much more. I mean, this guy is it when it comes to the paranormal for the government. But he heard me. He was with me on the Cape Fear River when I said, John, they're here right now. And I pointed up. And when we looked up within 10 seconds, it appeared in a flash. Boom. There it is. From nowhere, it appeared. And then it started flashing and went off to the south. And so he wrote about that in chapter two of his book, Reality Denied. And these are the kind of people that have been studying with me for all these years. Hmm. Can you talk about some of the phenomena that happened at the Monroe Institute? Yeah. Um, in fact, the, the, um, the helmet thing on the History Channel was a recreation of what we did at the Monroe Institute. Of course, they didn't have as much luck with two of their machines. I kept my brain kept interfering with their machine twice. It did two machines. The first one, they worked an hour on me trying to get it to work, scratching my head and putting glue and electrodes and and rebooting their computer 15 times and it wouldn't work. And the electrical engineer is like Ross from University of Virginia. He looked at me and I was great big. He said, there's just no reason this thing shouldn't be working. And the other scientist, it was a female, she started laughing. She said, you've defeated this machine. So they went in and pulled a new one out of the box, wired it up, used the same harness, same thing. Every time they would hook me up, my brain would start reading on the left side only. No pulse, no nothing. Just the left side, no right side. They'd unhook the machine. My brain continued to read on their computer, unhook to the left side. They put the new machine on, did the exact same thing. So finally, they went to their old shower cap that's made in the 50s probably, and um it was a 32 sensor machine where they could only read brainwaves. And, but we'd go out every night and film the phenomenon. And we had a lot of orbs appear. Uh, we filmed it, documented it. Uh, our friend Rob, Le uh, Rob, what is Rob's name? Freeman, Rob Freeman from Canada. He brought this $250,000 camera array he had. And uh, he's been chasing the phenomenon forever. And um, that night, he and I were having a conversation. We kind of got, I kind of got upset with them because they kept trying to have an excuse for everything that would appear. And I'm like, look, you're going to ruin it for everyone if you don't just let the phenomenon manifest. I'm telling you, if you'll quit being judgmental, trying to, to, to label it, it'll manifest for us in a better way he said okay we'll try that so uh, along about the fourth night we were there um i guess it was 11 o'clock he walks up to me i'm sitting beside colonel alexander and my daughter and some other folks and he he walked up he stood up and he said chris i want to apologize um you taught me something and when he did, I stood up and I reached out to hug him. And I said, uh, I appreciate that, Rob. Um, thank you. And the minute I hugged him, flash. And you hear somebody in the group say, flash, look at that. And suddenly we all look up and it's flashing, flashing, flashing. 
So Rob goes over to his camera, and it's just this big, multifaceted thing on a pole, a tripod. He she puts the camera on it, and for the next hour, a whole hour, we filmed that orb flashing. And what's amazing is it never moved. The whole star field moved but the orb never moved out of position. So that was pretty amazing evidence that that is on YouTube. You can find it under Rob Freeman Monroe Institute. Hmm. I'm definitely going to yeah. do that. Um, yeah. There's another story you tell so great. Um, in, the be- in the beginning of the book, you hook us with the story of an, an attempted Pope assassination. Like, can you hit on that a little bit? Like the voices, like were they, were they the beings coming out of the radio? Like what was that? As the beings were coming out of the radio. Um, what it was is, and this is a whole nother story that I wrote, but it didn't get published because the book got too long. There was a lot of stuff we never talked about. But there was a scientist there. Her name is Pam Ness. Pam um, is a government research scientist, but works out of... Um, uh, Wake Forest University, right? So she comes, she calls me and wants to investigate this paranormal thing. She brings her assistant, Ashley, and we're out at this burning tree. A lot of paranormal stuff, orbs all around the tree. We'd always see them. You know, be in the house and look out in the orb around the tree, floating, just going around it. Smoke going around and around the tree. You can see pictures of it on my Instagram. I mean, it would just wrap itself and it would fly away from the tree and fly by us. This kind of thing. Documented it well. So Pam has me standing there and there's probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 other guests that happened to be there. I had invited them when Pam said, I'll come. We'll just enjoy the whole group. So she's got a she calls it a voice ghost box. I'd never seen stuff like this, but it makes this awful racket like uh, white noise. And it's ticking, t- 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 kind of like that. She says it's sweeping millions of frequencies, right? And it, these go- ghosts can talk through it. Well, in, in a normal investigation, she explained, she'd have like five or six recorders going everywhere. And they might get one electronic voice phenomena one in a whole night of investigation well we got 350 i mean this thing was talking like rattle 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 in sentences and we all were standing in there and we heard my friend uh, foxy's son the name jason come through well he, he foxy's from pennsylvania i met him through groups you know, he was suffering because his son died. Well, it changed his life when he heard this. And uh, then the next thing we hear is this uh, voice that said, Danger, Pope, Chris, you must help him. I'm like, well, we all heard that. That was pretty audible, you know, pretty crazy. By the way, she has all this recorded. And it just kept on talking about it. He's in danger. You must help him. So I called a friend up in Pennsylvania that knows everybody, everybody. I mean, he's really connected. I'd met him in 2013. And uh, so I, I said, Larry, you know, the Pope's coming to Philadelphia. He, he just he's in Washington and New York. And is just, tr- you know, in the wide open. No problems, but he's coming to Philadelphia and I'm hearing there's going to be a tent on his life somehow. So right away, within a week, I'm up in Philadelphia and there's Colonel John Alexander. He was part of Project Stargate, one of the creators of it. Uh, The Men Who Stare at Goats, George Clooney, that movie is after Colonel John Alexander. So that's when I first met him. And they wanted to do some remote viewing. And pretty soon I started getting these images of the Ben Franklin Bridge. And that um, they would be coming from that direction, maybe by boat up the, I think it's the Delaware River. And so um, we ended up 
touring all over and found the boat ramp that I described perfectly where it was and which side of the bridge it was on. And I told them in full view. And when they found that it wasn't long, the secret service and the CIA was involved. And so when the Pope came to Philadelphia, they shut the whole Ben Frank, they shut the whole city down and made everybody walk across the Ben Franklin bridge. If you're coming from New Jersey, you're not driving in, you're going to walk. And it, it, it was a big deal. And they actually arrested a young guy um, threatening, trying to, to, to threaten him. So they arrested him. And that happened early on, a couple of weeks before he showed up. But it was the first, it was good three weeks before he appeared in Philadelphia is when I first made him notice about this thing. So, wow. Quite crazy, right? And what does that make like how do you feel when this stuff happens right like this unexplainable phenomena happens to you like what is going through your mind i just let it happen i've learned that um uh, i'm totally not afraid uh i think that they're just using me to to get the word out to you know, the, to be known. I think they, I know they want to be known. They're going to awaken humanity into this new knowledge that um, we didn't come from monkeys, basically. Mm -hmm. Not ill. That's what I think their plan is, is to awaken us all to something much greater. And then maybe peace will come sure. to this planet. Have you ever experienced like the God energy, right? Like you've, you've experienced many orbs and the lady and beings, but have you ever experienced like the God force? Uh, well, let's say this, um, my pop up on my phone. I, um, uh, I was given a set of, uh, well, you know, I'm kind of, I love the Monroe Institute. So I was given a headset. $200 JVC noise cancellation headset and uh, uh, the Monroe tapes. I have quite a few of those and some of them were custom made uh, for our Monroe retreat. They're, you know, you just couldn't buy them. And uh, I, I just listening to this with these headset song, I went into this meditation state and was basically out of it. But suddenly I woke up and these headsets had melted around the whole thing. Where they, and it, they don't work anymore. It, it messed them up. But they had melted. The plastic where they hold the air muscle on completely melted. And uh, the people that gave them to me called it what they called kundalini, which I had no idea what that was. But, so, yeah, I melted a set of headsets at that. that um, I'm glad you didn't fry this interview. Um. <laughs> well, I do things like that. Like they're, they're machines, you know, two of the machines at Monroe wouldn't work on me. And when I was out at Skinwalker, I walked by um, and I just gave you a hint, right? I was out at the ranch back in April and they had a bunch of equipment there. And when I got close to it, it all started malfunctioning and their gamma ray detector went off the rails. It, it got so high, two of them, that they moved us inside. They thought it was unsafe. Then they found out the machine reset itself. It wouldn't even work for a half an hour. I got to ask this question before we end, though, because um, I want to respect your time. How can people raise their frequencies or raise their vibrations to experience this phenomena for themselves? Be positive. I've learned uh, no matter... I had to create this shell around me from all the people throwing darts and you know, accusing me of being everything from crazy to, to in bed with the devil. Um, so I, 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 I've gotten pretty good at not paying that any attention. I feel like these people just are unaware and they don't know they're uninformed. You know, it was hard for me to, to be studying with NASA scientists and government, high level government people and never could talk about it because it, I was asked not to. Now I can, but 
my own neighbors were calling me crazy and I wanted to say, I wanted to grab them and say, look here, if you only knew where I was this week, but I learned to take it. I learned to live in my own place and find my own happiness. Be positive. If the news bothers you, turn it off. If, um, you know, don't watch all this scary stuff. This is just, it plants these negative things in your head and you can't hardly get them out. So many people will wake up in the morning. First thing they do is turn the TV on and there's war in Ukraine and suffering and kids, you know, crying. And all day you got to carry that in your thoughts. All day. Get it out of your thoughts. Only be positive. Be kind to everyone. Uh, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about all of us. Uh, none of us are better than anybody else. So many people think they are. Um, but just find your happiness. Being positive is everything. And that's why if I was negative and I watched all that, I would never see the phenomenon. It would flee from me. I'm telling you, I've seen it too much. People would come here. And one person in the group would find nothing's happening. Why? So I start listening to each person without them knowing. And I hear one over and they're negative. And then I've done this. I go to their group leader and say, you got to get this guy out of here if you want to see anything. And we've had people had to leave. And suddenly the phenomenon just shows up. So I've been at it a long time. It's almost 17 years. That's a long time. That's two PhDs, you might say. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, PhD means nothing when it comes to this. Your title means nothing. We're all on level playing field when it comes to this phenomenon. Is it your frequency though? Is it like, is that how you connect with it? Like you, to your point of being positive, right? Is it saying more prayers? Is it having that will not giving up when it doesn't work the first seven times, like pushing through and like saying, all right, I'm committed. I'm going to connect with this. I'm going to, I'm, I'm really going to surrender, you know, my will and, and make it the greater will of everyone. Right. Like, is that, is that how you connect? Yeah. And, and two, I don't know all of it but i know they're researching my brain a lot like there's something there they don't tell me they won't tell me and i think the history channel might reveal some of that what they found uh, but I, I don't know i don't understand it i just know that it came in prayer in 2007 when i was at my lowest point and so I just go out every night and I was so happy to see it. it and it, I wanted to see it every night. So I go out and I'd say the same prayer. So just pray. And it, it keeps working. Well, Dr. Bledsoe, um, <laughs> I think you've earned your PhD in this phenomena. Um, I think there's many that would agree with me. I just can't thank you enough for taking the time for, for sharing your story for, I just want to say like reading your book and everything that you had to go through, like I'm just amazed by your internal will that you, you were able to draw from to keep pushing through this, the doubt, the, you know, being ostracized by society and your church and a lot of your family members and, and being uncomfortable in that, but still doing the work. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, man, thank you so much for putting this out there. Appreciate it. I still am, I still have family members even that um, that are highly religious, right? And they're they're saying you're playing with the devil. It has never quit. I think we're gonna all wake up to find a, a new knowledge that um, that uh, they won't expect. So, I think you know the knowledge already. I think you know what it is. I think I do, but it's you know. I, I don't want to influence others. <laughs> Everybody, to, to re you read the book. That'll help you. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop recording. You can influence me. I can tell you that. Um, Chris, man, how can people connect with you? You can. Uh, best way to find me is go to my website, ufoofgod.com. There, you can find my Amazon link to buy the book, or you can go straight to Amazon. But if you go to my website. Uh, we're actually doing a drawing right now with some 
signed hardback copies from Jim Simi Van. Wow. John Alexander and myself. So we're going to do these special. And um, you can find my social media there, Instagram, Facebook. And on Instagram, I post some videos, not, you know, probably 50 or 60 videos there out of thousands. And there's some very good ones I haven't posted. But we're planning on sharing it all in time. Hmm. But I think you'll find it highly interesting. Chris, man, thank you so much for taking the time. This is this has meant the world to me. And I, again, I can't thank you enough. Appreciate you, Trey. I'm honored you had me on your show. Mm-hmm.